this book is more than just a novel. Tell us what we've got here. So, Non-Competence and Others, which is this book, is a collection. It's work by Rose Macaulay, all writing against war. The novel, Non-Competence non and Others, it's a difficult word, that's about a third of the book. Um, this is a novel she published in 1916 during the First World War and it was the first novel advocating pacifism and the end of the war to be published in Britain during the war because it came out a little bit before H.G. Wells' Mr. Britling Sees It Through, which is the more famous of the two. The next two thirds of the book are made up of essays and newspaper articles and columns in magazines plus one short story. And I put these together because Rose Macaulay wrote so much about pacifism and so much against war during her, her long, long career as a novelist and as a journalist that I thought it was important to have everything in one volume. Um, the essays begin in 1935 when she's writing for The Spectator and she write these, writes these columns observing life but very much focusing on what was happening with fascism and the growth of fascism in Europe with Italy taking over Ethiopia with the rise of the British National Party. There's a really important essay when she attends a rally at the Royal Albert Hall with um, Oswald Mosley and the fascists, which is really extraordinary because she's at the same time very satirical, very dismissive of these extraordinary people, but also perfectly aware of how dangerous they're going to be if they are allowed to have power in Britain. And then the essays continue to more long form polemics about the importance of pacifism and why war is wrong um, from various standpoints. And then we move into the Second World War. In the, in the Second World War she was in her 60s and she was driving an ambulance as a volunteer. She was an absolutely shocking driver but she loved driving so ambulance driving was her thing. And she writes a couple of long long columns for the feminist magazine Time and Tide about what it's like driving in the blitz at night collecting bodies, collecting wounded people. And these are these essays are some of the most heartfelt things she ever wrote. And finally, the collection ends with her short story, published in 1942, called Miss Anne Struthers Letters, which basically retells the story of what it was like when her own flat was bombed and she was made completely homeless. She lost absolutely everything, including the letters from her secret lover, Gerald O'Donovan. In the short story, this lover has just died and the laid character only recovers one scrap of the letters. In real life, O'Donovan was dying of cancer. So Macaulay pours her entire grief at not only losing, losing her life, her books, but also her lover in her 60s. And it is one of the most important short stories of the Second World War, and it's quite hard to get hold of. So it was really important to have it in this collection. What's the effect of the different texts spanning 30 years? It's very interesting because in the First World War she was early, early to mid-30s, very energetic, very sprightly, at the, approaching the height of her power. She'd been a novelist for about ten years and Non-Competence and Others was her eighth novel. But she really flung herself into it as a novelist and editing the novel was really quite devastating because you relive the First World War and all the terrible hypocrisies and tragedies that are happening on the home front. You, you never get to, the, to the, uh, the battlefront at all. But then in the 30s, when she's doing her journalism, she's older and wiser and far more cynical, but also more relaxed, shall we say. She hasn't got the urgency, but she can sit back and say, well, of course, this and this and this and this is why. She's so knowledgeable. She was a, she was a scholar and she was a very, very wise and astute person. She was a, a perfect columnist. And then when you get to the Second World War, she's an old lady um, and she's suffering along with everybody else in Britain who was suffering from the Blitz, well, London who was suffering from the Blitz. But the, the quality of her prose becomes more pared down, it's more refined and it's like the shining bones, whereas before in the First World War you had the whole body. In the Second World War it's the essentials only. Absolutely brilliant stuff. How did you select the essays? I read everything she wrote. Um, because back in, I think, 2006, I, de I decided that when I was an academic that the world needed a collection of essays on Rose Macaulay because there wasn't one. There was a lot of scattered articles about Rose Macaulay in various journals, but there wasn't anything in one single book. So I worked for about six years to put a collection together 
and it was eventually published by Routledge. And during that time, I put together the complete bibliography of Macaulay's work, so I read every single bit of journalism that I could find, which meant rediscovering over 200 new articles and essays. An awful lot is still out there because she was extremely profligate. She wrote for anything and anyone <clears throat> and didn't record what she wrote, so a lot of it was guesswork. So I know there's stuff I haven't discovered, but of the stuff I did discover, I reread everything for this volume and I pulled out the stuff that really said what Macaulay was, um, felt was important about anti-fascism, about pacifism, and about her war is wrong. It wasn't difficult to put them together. Um, many, many of her articles touch on how bad war is, but the ones that were truly very, very pacifist, were, that was the whole point of the article. So I didn't have to make any difficult choices by leaving anything out. It was quite clear what needed to be in. Who will want to read this? Everybody will want to read this. Um, people who are interested in the literature of war, who are interested in pacifism, um, the history of the evolution of ideas during the 30s as political circumstances changed in Europe, and people who love Rose Macaulay's writing. It's a joy to read her non-fiction. When she's not telling a story, when she's actually in front of you speaking as Rose Macaulay, this is what Rose Macaulay thinks, this is what Rose Macaulay has observed. We don't have much that's in print now of her non-fiction writing. Next year we'll be bringing out another collection of her, 90, her, her essays from 1935, which is an absolute joy because it's a riot of comedy. These essays are more serious, 